Hello, hello. Welcome to the Takedown with Nick. I'm your host, Nick. <laughs> Remember what our motto is, people, subverting power or radical thought. And today I have a, a special guest. It's really a special edition. You know, we do first mon first and third Mondays, but, uh, you know, due to basically scheduling conflicts or whatnot, we were able to get a General Baraka to join us and have a conversation with us about, you know, having an internationalist perspective and why it's important to the left to do that. So, Jamu, I'm not going to necessarily, you know, kind of introduce you, but I want you to introduce yourself to to the audience. Well, thank you, Nick. It's really a pleasure and an honor to to be with you tonight. Um, uh, it's really this is a really a critical moment to to delve into these these important issues. Um, in particular, the issue of why is absolutely necessary to have an internationalist perspective if one. Uh, is serious about uh, left politics, and if one self-identifies as a as a radical, um, me Ajamu. Well, you know I've been um, involved in in this struggle, uh, this resistance, this uh, struggle for transformation for most of my um, most of my adult life. Um, I grew up on, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and that experience not only exposed me to the, the contradictions of, of racial oppression, but also of, of class exploitation and class oppression. Uh, so it um, sensitized me to uh, the, the, the intersectional uh, reality that many of us live, even though that term wasn't, of course, in play. But, you know, having a, a mother who was a uh, a, a womanist. Um, it sensitized me to the issues around gender and those contradictions. Um, uh, watching her grapple with the issues around patriarchy and and the consequence of being a uh, a, a black feminist um, mm -hmm. and being a working class woman, a black woman in that. You know, I, I had a chance to really begin to develop a perspective that uh, in a very, very elementary ways, um, you know, provided the kind of intersectional framework that really uh, helped me to, uh, to follow a political course that always had me looking for, for connections, interconnections. Um, mm -hmm. So that sort of curiosity, that kind of framework, that kind of approach to, to uh, knowledge uh, it led me to the uh, being attracted to the kind of uh, political articulations uh, that I saw coming from uh, the Revolutionary Action Movement, uh, the Black Panther Party, because uh, these were uh, parties that uh, were making those kinds of connections, even though the gender component of it was, was very weak uh, to a certain extent. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I understood that the issues that, that Black people face in the U.S. could not just be reduced to the issues of, of race, uh, but that uh, our very uh, existence was structured also by uh, by class uh, and class relations. So that was the perspective that led me to the kind of politics that I pursued. I uh, ended up having to go into the military, got caught up in the last part of the draft during the uh, Vietnam conflict. I ended up in Europe, uh, but in, in Europe and in the military it became a laboratory because we were, um, uh, organizing and we organized inside the military and we were studying because at that point it to be a radical meant you had to take study seriously we Wait, let me let me break let me break into that for a quick second because i want to i want to emphasize the point yeah you know what were you what were you studying specifically like when you say study because like a lot of times when i try to bring about history or something like that everybody says well that's not important what's important to me today but you said something very important you said in order to be a radical you must take study seriously exactly so we were studying historical uh, uh, tracks we're studying the works of people like kwame nkrumah sekul Ture, uh amakar cabral uh of course uh, france Fanon, uh people who were involved in the anti-colonial struggle we were of course studying um uh, marx and lenin mm. uh, trotsky uh we uh, mao uh we believe that one had to be grounded in theory uh, but, you know, when you place that, those theoretical productions within their historical context, you don't get confused by the, pre the conditions you find yourself in in the present. But well, we understood that 
as Cabral said, you know, without revolutionary theory, there could be no revolution. And so we had to, in fact, ground ourselves in an understanding of the world. And that meant an understanding of the, its historical uh, development, uh, the social, economic, and political conditions, and how those conditions uh, were, were shaped and and um, transformed themselves over time. So, you know, we engaged in that kind of, of, of study. We understood the issue of culture also. So we would, you know, read the, the latest uh, articles coming from the uh, from the Black World magazine, and and um, you know, so we we studied everything, including uh, uh, tracks that dealt with issues of of how to conduct uh, 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 you know uh, other components of resistance. So yeah, we did that, uh, and we uh, um, not only studied among ourselves, we also uh, conducted uh, political education classes among other uh, members of the military. Once I came out of the military, I ended up going south, uh, ended up in Florida, uh, and then in Georgia, uh, where I was both a student and an organizer. Um, I gravitated toward uh, uh, working within the human rights field because, like Malcolm, I understood that the struggle for uh, black liberation and the struggle for global transformation uh, was in fact that a global struggle uh, and that part of the uh, black radical tradition was a tradition that had at its center a internationalist perspective so we understood that uh, through our studies and through our lived experiences that uh, to take a u.s centric uh, position was in fact to take a reactionary position so for us international solidarity uh, was was fundamental uh, having that international uh, perspective that made those connections between uh, the domestic and the international uh, were fundamental for, for me and my organizing work in the South uh, beginning in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And then from there, I just continued to, to organize and work in various uh, organizations, uh, movements, uh, the uh, uh, environmental movement, the human rights movement, the uh, anti-death penalty movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, until today. Now, see, just in that, that that one question, you've you've basically I have more than enough to talk for like five hours. So I think uh, let me start by by talking about what you said. Three things that you said that 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 just echo inside my mind. You you said without the radical, there is no revolution. Without without the without revolutionary theory, there could be no revolution. Without revolutionary theory. There is no revolution. And, and that runs counterintuitive to, to, to what you'll hear from people when you when you when you try to bring up things. And, and you also said without putting revolutionary theory in its historical context, you can be confused. Exactly. Again, I think, you know, that's kind of what we're running up against right now. Right now, um, basically in where we are, people a lot. There's a lot of people out there. And everybody's so focused on the here and now. And when you try to, at least from the common person's perspective, right? When you try to tell them about, well, you know, actually this is a continuum of events that have been happening over a period of time. And there's a context and things of that nature in which this stuff exists. It becomes either overwhelming or, or almost like it just puts people off. They don't want to become interested in that, but they still want to, to hold on to, you know, this idea of being a left or being a radical or trying to change something. And, and what would you, what, what do you think about that? Well, you know, it, we have a cultural challenge. I mean, um, there, there is a tradition of, of anti-intellectualism within our movement in the U.S. Um, and there is the, the, the movement has been sort of infected by uh, in individualism, um, uh, ill discipline, um, and a almost a reflective, reflexive uh, opposition to anything that feels like too much structure. It, too much structure feels like uh, authoritarianism. And as a consequence, you know, we are not, we, we have a, a challenge in terms of the kinds of, of Uh-oh. Looks like we just uh, lost uh, a Jammu right there for a split second, guys. I think, um, you know, it's important. Oh, uh, he's, he just popped back in. Yeah, yeah. So is it so what so what I'm what I'm suggesting is that that th those kinds of, of 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 attitudes those kinds of sentiments that 
um, is, is oppositional to the issue of study that um, sees intellectual engagement as something that is, is only is, uh, pursued by the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, is, these are things that have to be struggled against because they're not serious positions. You know, we talked before we came on, on online that, you know, I spent a lot of time in Latin America. And I can tell you that in Latin America, uh, uh, people are serious about uh, internal political education and that process. You have people you're running to that have never stepped foot in a college campus or college uh, room, uh, but who can break down uh, uh, in intimate detail what uh, global neoliberal capitalism is. But they can tell you, you know, the different uh, perspectives around uh, imperialism that can uh, talk about uh, macroeconomic issues. Why? Because they have uh, uh, an eternal political education process in which uh, to be serious, to be a serious radical, to be a serious revolutionary, you have to, in fact, study. You can't just be coming off the, the, the uh, you just can't be running your mouth. You can't just be talking about stuff off the side of your neck. That these are serious issues. And if you are serious about building real popular power, you're serious about taking power away from these these criminals. You have to be, you have to understand that you have to be organized, you have to be disciplined, you have to be structured, uh, and you have to be committed to real work. And sometimes uh, we had really not that committed to that uh, uh, in the U.S. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, to add to that, we have to remember that if you don't know you know, the situation you're in, how can you, you know, possibly want to change it? If you don't understand how something works, how do you transform it? How do you change it? And how do you make sure those changes are going to be ones that actually change from where we are to something else and not just be like a facelift, but everything underneath is exactly the same. And it kind of deteriorates over time to being in the exact same spot. And I think I had an episode where I talked about that, guys. You know, I have a treasure trove of videos and, and I like to have people like uh, Jamu on because a lot of the stuff that he's talking about are things that I've kind of laid a groundwork on before when I've talked about some of these things, like how revolution works, what change is, the radical imagination, things like this. This is, this is stuff that he's drawing upon to give this critique. And I think it's important that we all kind of take some time to really absorb and think about what he's saying. Let's talk about uh, Latin America in particular. When we say having an international perspective on the left, let's, let's kind of let's kind of try to dive in there kind of just talk about i don't know kind of just take it from there talk about whatever you feel is important that we can draw upon to add to this discussion well i'll give you an example of why it's important for us to have an international perspective and to be linked up uh in real ways with uh struggles that are taking place throughout the world but specifically in latin america um just recently in the country of colombia uh, the black uh, movement in Colombia organized a national strike against the Colombian government. Uh, they were calling for the improvements, the material improvements of the people uh, of, in Colombia. Uh, they wanted to make sure that in the peace process that's unfolding in Colombia, that uh, the interests of the uh, black folks were going to be uh, uh, respected uh, and protected. Um, and specifically in the city of Buenaventura, which is the uh, national, the, their uh, port city, uh, they were concerned about the fact that uh, they had a uh, crumbling infrastructure, uh, water, water that they only had access to for a few hours a day, uh, three or four times a week. Um, they were concerned about the activities of paramilitaries. They had a whole host of concerns. Uh, they were concerned about the fact that over 60% of the people in that city were living in poverty, and there was no response from the, from the federal government. So what they did, they organized a national strike. And just what they did, Nick, they shut down an entire city. They shut the city down. They closed the city off. They took the entire city, all of the entry points and exit points in that city, and they held that city for 22 days. Nothing could go in or out. Now, did you know about that? No, I did not. I'll bet you that 95% of your viewers knew nothing about that also. Because instead of us understanding, instead of us being exposed to that, this historic struggle in Colombia, instead the corporate media was uh, more concerned with inund inundating the, uh, uh, the, the airways with images of Venezuela. 
But here you have this righteous struggle in Colombia. But because Colombia is a as an ally of the U.S., um, the corporate media didn't see fit to cover that historic struggle. Because if I ask your your your, your viewers, when was the last time you heard about a situation like that where a movement took a city of five hundred thousand people and held it for twenty two days? It's unheard of. In fact. You know, uh, I'm asking people, and we are looking at, we may have to go all the way back to Paris, uh, the Paris Commune in the 19th oh, yeah. century. Yeah. So here we have this historic struggle, but very few people outside of Latin America know about it. But if we had closer international ties, we had closer, closer structural uh, and communication uh, uh, connections, we would be able to more effectively make sure that uh, that information was, was disseminated to uh, people in the U.S. and really people throughout the world. Now, we were able to get that word out to a certain extent uh, through this new organization that we had put in place called the Black Alliance for Peace. And we were the first ones to really begin to disseminate that information. Uh, but, you know, it was up against uh, a lot of um, a lot of barriers. But my point is that here was this historic struggle uh, led by black people, uh, but very, pe very few people uh, knew it. Very few people know about the connection between the Colombian government and the U.S. Uh, very few people are following the peace process that's supposed to be trying to address uh, one of the longest uh, insurgencies uh, on the planet. Uh, so, again, for us, you know, having that perspective is vitally important. It's, it's important because then we will be able to critique positions like our dear friend Bernie Sanders who says something like uh, the Saudis should get their hand, hands more dirty in the Middle East. When we have people who are educated, who have that international perspective, they will be in a position to call our friend out and say, Bernie, the Saudis are already, the hands are already dirty. In fact, their hands are dripping in blood. Mm -hmm. So having that kind of perspective helps us to have real accountability with these politicians, and it helps us to avoid political confusion in terms of who we are going to support, what kinds of positions we need to support. So, you know, again, for us, we're serious about transformative uh, politics in the U.S., that has to be connected to our understanding of how what we are struggling against in the U.S. is fundamentally connected to the structural, the global structural realities, and that one cannot deal with uh, the U.S. without dealing with those global structures. They are interconnected. Let me let me ask you a question. You said something very interesting there when you said um, confusion. So. Let's say, well, actually, let me let me pull it back. Before I ask that question, let me ask you another question. When, why do you think this type of information doesn't get out? What is, why is that information sort of like suppressed? Well, I mean, you know, we, we know they're suppressed by the corporate media because they have an agenda that's, of course, different from the agenda of, of, of the people. They have an agenda that is, is geared toward advancing the perspectives and the, and the interests of the, of the oligarchy. Of the bourgeois oligarchy uh, but the question that i think we have to pose though for uh for, for progressives and for left forces is why is it that we don't have more progressive more radical information disseminated that is uh politically uh clear uh that to me is the question i mean for example you know why is it that we have such disagreement and confusion around issues like uh what what side should we be on uh, in relationship to the struggle in, say, Syria? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the the nature of the of the of the revolutionary process uh, in Egypt? Um, uh, why did we have uh, disagreements around whether or not uh, we should oppose uh, NATO intervention in Libya? I mean, there's real confusion among the left, um, and part of that confusion is that we have been um, taking an ideological beating. We have not been able to counter the, the uh, constant drumbeat of propaganda coming from not only the, the right, but the, the infiltration of the left by, uh, by liberalism that has uh, helped to uh, create a, 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 an environment of real political confusion. You know, so we have people who are you know, concerned about humanitarian issues in some of these, these nations that are, are, are supposed to be uh, led by dictators. Uh, and we understand that there are contradictions. But see, there was a point, Nick, 
where for uh, radicals in this country, we understood that if a country found itself in the crosshairs of US imperialism, uh, that we had to look at that situation very closely and that we usually would con conclude that despite whatever the internal contradictions of that process was, uh, the very fact that the U.S. was targeting that nation state suggested that we needed to probably seriously consider the opposite position, that uh, if we were concerned about uh, U.S. imperialism and U.S. imperialism strengthening itself, that uh, it didn't make sense for us to be on the same side of U.S. imperialism. But we have situations now where uh, left forces end up on the same side with U.S. imperialism uh, in Libya, uh, in Syria, uh, in Zimbabwe, um, and various other, uh, 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 in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, so there's real confusion here uh, among the left, uh, primarily in the, in the northern countries. Let me, let me come in right here, because, you know, when you're describing it the way, when you describe it the way you are, it seems as though, you know, we, we're, we're stuck in almost like an alternate reality, you know, from, from what the truth is. On, on many of these issues because we haven't taken the time to closely examine these issues. And, and one of the biggest pieces of propaganda I hate, and I've been, I've been subject to this, is whenever I take a position like yours, an anti-imperialistic stance, right? Anti-imperialist stance. And I say, hey, you know, what's going on in Syria? You know, I, I always have to get into this thing where I'm bumping up against the narrative that the United States is like the hero coming in to save the people from some great evil or some great, uh, you know, personality like, you know, it's focused more on Assad and not really, it's like Assad is like bad and U United States good or NATO good, Russia bad. Like I have to bump up against that for some reason. And, and, I, and I would like you to elaborate. Well, I think what you're seeing is, is a reflection of the, of the right wing character of, of, of political discourse in the U.S. that has impacted also people who call themselves uh, leftists. That... You can't, we can't even get to a point where we seriously look at these, these very important political issues without the conversation, the discourse being reduced to this issue of personalities, uh, whether or not uh, uh, Assad is a dictator or uh, what are the real interests of, of Putin and the Russians. Uh, it, is, it is really a, 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 a sad and dangerously simplistic discourse that we have here in the U.S. I mean, look. But those of us who have been following and know that, that particular region, the so-called Middle East, uh, and know the politics of the Ba'ath Party, for example, we know the history of, of that party. We know how that party uh, and that movement emerged. That, move, that, move, that party and that, that movement emerged as a, uh, a right-wing response to authentic leftism in the so-called Middle East. So we know what kind of politics we're talking about. So nobody's going to be pro-Assad. You know, but you have to call things the way you see it. And when, you know, the, the very fact that the, the Syrian government has positions that are uh, some in some ways counter to U.S. interests in the Middle East, that is why they find themselves in the crosshairs of the U.S. And that because the U.S. is concerned about the Assad uh, government being dictatorial or authoritarian or repressive or whatever. The U.S. never cares about that kind of stuff. In fact, the U.S. is responsible for most of the repression uh, on this planet. So, you know, these kind of moralistic positions, you know, are, are, are really uh, counterproductive and really somewhat reactionary. We've got to look at the at the interests that are in play and not the personalities. Look, everybody who's serious, they understand the nature of the government in Russia. I mean, how did Putin come to power? Putin was given power by who? Boris Yeltsin, a right wing political clown. We understand the, the emergence of the, the oligarchies in, in Russia. We understand uh, the social base of the, of the Russian government. But what does that have to do with the fact that the Syrian government uh, invited the Russians in because of the destabilization taking place in that country? And that if the Syrian government is destroyed, uh, that's going to result in the strengthening of U.S. imperialism. That should be enough to cause people on the left to look at that situation differently and more seriously so yeah we can't get to serious analysis of these of these uh of these various issues uh, because of the simplistic moralism that seems to be uh the uh, the uh, the predominant uh, 
uh, discourse and framework uh, that people are using these days. Let's let me let me also add something for our audience. The the examples that Ajamu just gave with with, um, with Russia and and Syria, we have to remember that you know at the time there were leftist politics going on in those countries, and those those politics were crushed by by the state. You know, usually, you know, with U.S. support. Because you know, there's a such thing as the uh, the danger of a good example, and yes. so you know, across the world, you know, whenever leftist politics begins to grow in a state, that state also can become a target for U.S. imperialism, and so that's something we have to keep in mind when we have these outgrowths of these right wing, you know, counter revolutions or, or things like that growing in a country. A lot of times that happens under you know after uh, the suppression of the left has taken place, usually by the state or outside forces. That's something we also need to kind of kind of massage into the evidence there. You know, I, I mean, I have plenty of friends who are on the left uh, from Syria uh, who were uh, opposed to to the Assad uh, government um, and who, who are legi- who had legitimate positions. Uh, but, but many of those friends that I have also are were opposed to uh, foreign intervention led by the Saudis and supported by the U.S. And that's something that the people in the West, in particular, in, in, in particular the U.S., don't seem to understand that these are that what 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 got stirred up in Syria were were nationalistic forces that even people who were opposed to to the Assad government found themselves fighting uh, for the integrity, the territorial and, and national integrity of that state as a consequence of this uh, war that was imposed on them by these outside forces. So, you know, it, 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 it made the situation in Syria e- enormously complex. You know, going back to another exa- another comment about, about the Russians and Putin. You know, the, when the uh, Obama administration uh, allowed the French to, and the British to talk them into uh, destroying the Libyan government, um, both the Chinese and the Russians could have put a halt to that. But well, they went along with this fictitious uh, notion of a so-called no-fly zone, in my opinion, knowing that that is going to lead to uh, a wholesale assault on the Libyan state, the most developed state on the African continent. Um, but you know, it wasn't in their interest to really oppose the West at that point. So they basically, you know, uh, sacrificed um, uh, uh, Gaddafi uh, until it became clear that. Uh, the U.S. that only uh, whetted their appetite because then they began to move toward uh, Syria, where the Russians have real serious interests in terms of, of wanting to maintain its uh, its own only external base and to make sure that uh, the Syrian government was not overthrown uh, in order for uh, for the those those forces there, Qatar and others, to have a land a line. Uh, an ability to run uh, pipe pipes from Qadar uh, through uh, Syria uh, to Turkey uh, to undermine the uh, liquefied natural gas uh, and oil coming from Russia to Western Europe. So they had an interest in making sure that uh, those plans to undermine uh, their government, their their economy, were not going to be successful. And that's why we have the quagmire that we have. Uh, in Syria, wow! We understand, where, we understand where 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 Putin and the Russians are coming from. They are looking out for their own objective national interests. And 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 nobody's doubting that. You know, nobody's saying that these actors are, are, are innocent. Like you said, they just sacrificed. You know, you know, a particular a particular area to to devastation with Libya. They just basically sacrificed it because it wasn't in their interest to to basically look out or stand up for that. It just wasn't in their interest to do so. So now you have a situation that kind of sucks for people in that country because nobody gave a crap about them, basically. And it destabilized the entire region. It's destabilized uh, parts of North Africa. It is directly connected to the destabilization taking place in, in Nigeria. Uh, it took place in Mali. Um, it, it was because the, the, the weapons that were uh, in Libya ended up being funneled uh, to Al Qaeda elements uh, throughout North Africa and into West Africa. Uh, so yeah, the were- military capacity of Boko Haram and a number a number of other uh, jihadist uh, organizations were enhanced as a consequence of the destruction 
of Libya. And this is all documented stuff. There's 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 actually a wealth of information out there for our audience on on you know weapon stockpiles that were formally secured by the Libyan government that Gaddafi held, and then once he fell, a lot of those stockpiles were seized by a number of groups and split up, and a lot of those weapons you know ended up in various regions doing you know all sorts of damage all over. So that, well, I think that's that's, that's, that's what John was referring to. Of course, that's what the CIA annex was involved in. When and when it was attacked, and those four uh, uh, U.S. citizens were were murdered, that there was a that they were involved in a gun running scheme. Everybody knows this, <laughs> a gun running scheme into into Syria. So and that was part of. That's why I wanted to see see that come out during the so called Benghazi hearings. But of course, they weren't going to touch that part of it. And you know, so funny. You know, whenever I tell somebody that hearings and things of that nature. You know, that's really political theater. You know, everybody's like, oh, no, you know, they're, they're really saying these things. And it's like, well, look, if you believe that those hearings that they put on TV are not theater to entertain and distract you from something else, then, you know, at this point, you know, we have to engage in just upturning your whole paradigm of how things really work. And, and that's a that's a very, very hard, long and slow process to really do with an individual just in casual conversation. But, you know, that just got kind of lets you know, like how far off the mark, you know, the common consensus really is when it comes to these issues. And uh, also to, to give everybody a little bit more clarity, when he says that Russia and China could have put the kibosh on um, the actions in Libya, he's referring to uh, the UN, correct? Through the veto of the Security Council? Yes, exactly. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody was aware of what he's talking about, because John was really bringing a lot of knowledge, but we want to provide a little bit of background so everybody understands, you know, where it is that he's making these accusations from, I mean, making, making these statements from, not accusations, they're statements. M most of them highly factual. Yes. It just takes a little bit of time and a little bit of legwork so you can get down and really understand the full context. Let me, let me ask you this, though. You know, a lot of people in, you know, I'm going to, Black people in general here, but whenever I speak to them about trying to constrain the United States government or trying to be active in an internationalist perspective, you know, a lot of what I hear is, you know, black people just aren't responsible. You know, we, we really don't have anything to say about, you know, what the United States does, you know, around the world, what foreign policy is. And, you know, and then I hear that also from from leftists, they just kind of give up on trying to have some sort of anti-imperialist message, either because A, it's too hard to up, you know, to up, uh, to basically turn over the apple cart, basically, you know, when you have a, the right wing the propaganda basically dominating everything, or they just accept, you know, passively that that's just not their issue. And if we can just get domestic policy right, you know, everything else will fall into place. And I, I want you to kind of go through that and talk about why that both of those are incorrect. Well, you know, the, the, the notion that black folks are only concerned with U.S. domestic politics uh, is, 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 is a myth. I mean, they, they, of course, there are many that, that, that that's where they are now. But if you look at the, uh, the black radical tradition, you look at black political thought, uh, you go back and take a look at the proliferation of black newspapers uh, up until the 1960s, you'll find that um, 30, 40 percent of their content covered international issues. We have always been a literate population when it came to the international context. One could not be a, a black radical in the U.S., for example, and not have uh, an, an internationalist uh, understanding and perspective. So this kind of narrowing of, of our political focus is a relatively recent phenomenon. I said meaning, meaning the last couple of decades. OK, so mm -hmm. we are trying to bring that uh, that internationalist focus back into the equation. That's why we have organized, uh, for example, the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, and the tagline of the Black Alliance for Peace is that it is a people-centered uh, human rights movement against war, um, militarism, and imperialism. Uh, we believe that uh, now is the time for us to try to revive uh, that uh, Black internationalist perspective and that traditional Black um, anti-war position and pro-peace position. So. Again, this is a relatively recent phenomenon, and even among uh, uh, some white leftists, there's a tendency to believe that uh, the net, well, they don't know much about the black radical tradition, but uh, there's a tendency to believe that black folks are not interested in the international uh, issues 
And in fact, many of us who engage in, in geopolitical analysis, uh, we very rarely get called on to provide our analysis to uh, U.S. audiences. Many of us end up getting uh, called by and, and, and providing interviews to outlets literally around the world, every place but the U.S. Because as, as Black radicals and intellectuals, you know, uh, for, for, for folks in the U.S., you know, um, we aren't seen as, as having an interest or expertise uh, when it comes to uh, geopolitical issues. So, you know, we have got to convince uh, uh, black folks that uh, it is in our interest to, in fact, have that kind of internationalist consciousness uh, that uh, is in our interest to, to be anti-war, uh, that is, our, is, is, is in our interest to connect up an anti-war posture and position uh, with a position of being uh, anti-repression uh, also within the U.S. because we find that uh, the repressive state apparatus that is responsible for killing black people and suppressing uh, our communities, black and brown communities, native communities in this country uh, are the same. It's the same repressive state that is pursuing uh, military adventures on behalf of the 1% um, uh, globally. So one cannot afford to be a U.S. centric. That if you're only looking at the domestic policies, uh, then not only are you failing uh, yourself uh, and your people, but you are failing the international community. You're failing people around the world because the U.S. is involved in so much criminal activity around the globe. It is responsible for most of the the human rights crisis that we see uh, throughout the throughout the world, and to leave people who are struggling uh, by themselves because you're only concerned about people in the U.S. Uh, is in fact objectively a reactionary and backward political position. So, I, I guess I mean, I mean this is probably going to be the same for this next question I'm going to ask you, but. What I was going to say is, what would you say to people that say, you know, black people, we can barely have, you know, clean water in our, in our in our cities. And, you know, we still haven't really achieved really much from the 60s. You know, in fact, we've probably slid back in many respects as far as progress. How can we, the people who have, you know, no power and no money, no capital, no real investment, how can we be useful in, in constraining the activities of the United States government? What would you say to that? I will say that basically you must not be believe in the possibility of, of, of change. You definitely can't call yourself a revolutionary. Because basically, if you understand uh, the conditions that are, that, are, that are created by this system, then you understand that the only way we're going to change those conditions is by changing the system. And that changing the system requires the system to be completely dismantled. If you're concerned about about the realities of our people, if you're concerned about op oppression, then you have to come to the maybe difficult conclusion that the only way we're going to address these issues, these concerns, is when we come to the position that this society, the way it's structured, the economy, the way it's organized, uh, the, the political uh, structures of this and institutions of this country uh, have to be radically transformed for ourselves and for people outside this country. So if you're concerned about the lack of water in Flint, or you're concerned about the, the joblessness among uh, teenagers, if you're concerned about the fact that uh, you don't have uh, adequate housing uh, and no health care, uh, then you also have to be concerned about the fact that there are people around the world who are also suffering in those same kinds of ways. And that the genesis of that suffering, the the forces responsible for that suffering are the same forces responsible for our suffering. This global, imperialist, capitalist, colonial, white supremacist patriarchy. So it says that basically, if you are serious about real uh, advancement, uh, then you have to uh, some way uh, embrace the notion that we can be more than what we are today and that we are in fact part of the majority and that there is in fact an alternative. These individuals who control the system are in a minority. We 
are dealing with conditions that have been created by other human beings and through our own human efforts we can transform those conditions that is the perspective of a, of a revolutionary we understand that people will will feel overwhelmed they feel like all they can do is get a few uh, uh, minor reforms but folks uh, this thing is over it can't be reformed the only way that we are going to be able to uh, address our conditions our issues we've got to embrace uh, revolutionary change. There's no other way. And and see, I, I really do agree with everything you said there. And, and and guys, I know I'm speaking to the audience now. If you followed my show, you know it's almost like uh, it's almost like you know we, we have a, a similar thought, a and I on these issues. And maybe it could be because I have taken the time to go back and try to understand the context. Maybe I've read something similar that he has. Or I've, I've been able to glean understanding from people like him because he is an elder and he has great wisdom and knowledge that we should all take advantage of while it's here and available. But I wanted to also point out that he said something very, very important right there. He said that, you know, reform versus transformation, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's the title of one of my episodes. And I, and I want you guys to take a, take a look at that because we have to understand that, you know, when you see people that proclaim to be on your side, but their vision is to return to, you know, return to something like the New Deal, except maybe expand it a little bit to include folks that were recently excluded or something like that. There's something we have to really grapple with, you know, that 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 the New Deal has failed. You know, it, it has achieved many things. But if it was really to be a lasting I mean, if it was really to be a success, it had to have been a lasting success. And it wouldn't have just devolved into, you know, like we're doing right now, where it's slowly decaying. You know, back to where we are now, we're still in this terrible position. If it had succeeded, we wouldn't be here. And that's something we have to understand moving forward, that if we want to change something, we have to go beyond the New Deal, beyond its limits, in order to have something that really stays in place and lasts. And also, you, you mentioned something else I wanted to also focus on. And you said it near the beginning. I forgot. I said three things you said that was very important. Political education. Why is it so important that everybody really takes some time, even even at a young age, even getting children involved and understanding what civics is, what their responsibility to other people is? You know, it's trying to combat this, this the belief of individual individualism, right? It's just trying to combat that nature because once you're thinking like that, it's too easy. I mean, they say some couple of words like, "Well, what's in it for you?" and then boom, you just turned off. You just mentioned that you know. How can we be concerned about our issues when, you know, these issues are happening around the world and they're all done by the same people for their benefit? You know, that individualism comes in. Well, I can only be concerned about me. There's nothing else I can do about the next guy. And it's just like that makes our number advantage almost ineffective. Well, you going to say something? No, 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 no. You're right. I mean, that's part of the, the, the ideological battle, the ideological struggle, because, you know, capitalism creates um, uh, certain values and disseminates those values and those values then are perceived by many people as just common sense so many people believe that uh, human beings are naturally competitive uh, individualistic uh, materialistic uh, that's just human nature well many of us say uh, uh, that that's bs that yeah. uh, human beings are, are are and can be more than that that what we are in fact seeing is a particular kind of ideological uh, position and so we say to people that, you know, a part of our revolutionary uh, agenda is to to recognize that we have to transform ourselves in the process of transforming our conditions, that we have to try to embody the new kind of person that we believe that we can we can create. So this notion that we should only be concerned about ourselves, only concerned about our, our immediate environment, that's what they want us to be concerned with. We say that, you know, we are more than just ourselves, that we are part of, of, of a collective, we are part of humanity, uh, and that uh, we should uh, be our brother's keeper. And so we can't just be selfishly looking at our conditions and concerned about ourselves, um, knowing that uh, even the relative privileges in the U.S. are as a consequence of the uh, economic in political underdevelopment and exploitation of people around the world. Look, the, the West is a creation of its colonial history. The material development of the West isn't a consequence of some type of internal cultural superiority. 
is a consequence of of, of violence uh, and war, uh, beginning with the invasion of the Americans in 1492. It took the, the Europe from uh, being a backwater region that nobody cared about to being a, a hegemonic force by the 18th century. But they became a force as a consequence of uh, uh, attempted genocide against uh, the native people of, of the Americas and in slavery, enslavement. You know, so this, this the material development, the advancement of, of the West is as a consequence of that kind of process. So we've got to understand that, you know, uh, those kinds of conditions, uh, that the kind of privilege that we have in the U.S., uh, that as other people are, are beginning to develop uh, and beginning to exercise real self-determination, um, beginning to have sovereignty over their own resources, that that's going to have a direct impact on the material lives of people in the U.S. The privileges that we have in this country the material uh, advancements in the U.S. and in the West, they have to change. There's no way that 10% of the world's population can continue to consume 40% of the world's resources. That's going to change. And I don't think people in the U.S. and in the West are prepared for that change. But we need to get them prepared for that, my brother. Okay. I want to take okay. a second here. There was a... There was a comment in the in the channel here. They wanted to they want to ask about um, your perspective on what's going on in Venezuela. And guys, keep in mind, you know, we'll be, we will be having a show specifically on that topic. But let's let's. I think that my concern with what was happening with the the list of nations that the U.S. had in its crosshairs, uh, they were primarily in the Middle East. I was we were trying to trying to re revive the anti war movement in this country because we knew. That, that as they went down that list, they're going to eventually come to Venezuela and South America uh, because the Obama, the Bush people and the Obama folks kind of didn't give that a lot of attention. Uh, but uh, they started to beginning in 2010, 2011. Uh, and we see that the, the consequence of that was the, the destabilization process. What we've seen in, uh, in Venezuela is the consequence of uh, a collaboration between the U.S. Uh, and the uh, plutocrats uh, in Venezuela to uh, undermine their their process in that country, uh, to unleash these right-wing thugs who are involved in all kinds of unspeakable uh, uh, activities uh, in that country. Uh, it is part of the U.S. effort to try to recolonize, if you will, uh, all of South America. Uh, they were concerned about Venezuela and Bolivia and Ecuador and 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 so part of 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 undermining these leftist forces uh, in in South America, uh, Venezuela was in fact the key. So our responsibility, in my opinion, as as radicals in the U.S., is to support uh, the Venezuelan government to reject the attempts by the U.S. to undermine the sovereignty of that country. Uh, and to stand in solidarity with the people who are trying to protect the integrity of their process, no matter how flawed uh, it may be. It is their process, and Venezuela is key to a revolutionary process throughout the Americas. And, and, and listen to what you said there. You name, you know, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Venezuela. You know, these are places where, you know, they, they've kind of just had like a, a resurgence of the left, so to speak, after coming out from under the boot of imperialism. In, in the mid 1900s and, and 70s and so on, you know, so, you know, these countries are right, right back on the crosshairs. And, and we had uh, Rafael Correa, you know, was, you know, they tried to assassinate him multiple times. You know, this was, this is a real deal. You know, this is kind of what's going on in, in Latin America. So these places are really under, under threat. And you said something that was very interesting, you know, and it ties back to something I said earlier when I said, you know, a lot of times when you have these right wing, you know, this rising of the right in a country, a lot of times that that's usually, you know, happening in response to a suppression of the left. And sometimes that suppression is is sponsored by the United States, you know, by outside forces to more, maintain more, hegemonic more, control. More, more sometimes, uh, most of the time, it is initiated by the U.S. The U.S. is, a, is the number one criminal uh, regime on this planet. And almost every backward 
state that you find on this on this planet that is actively under suppressing their own people are, are usually uh, clients or vassals uh, of the U.S. state. So no, it's, it's, it is it is usually most of the time that you find the U.S. involved. Look, I mean, who? How can how can one explain the fact that the the, the Saudis are the U.S. allies? Or you know the, the fact that the, 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 there was no, the, 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 what happened in Egypt with the, the coup in Egypt. I mean, you know Honduras uh, under uh, Obama and and Hillary oh, Clinton. Yeah. I mean, you know you go right down the line of the the, this, the criminal activity. Uh, Liberia, I mean uh, uh, Libya. You know, I mean it, it is is incredible the, the expanded drone warfare. I mean, you know. If there was real international law and real international accountability, if there was a criminal court that wasn't uh, a bias, uh, then you have people like uh, Tony Blair, George Bush, uh, uh, Rumsfeld, and Barack Obama in the dock for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So these are the, the, the criminals that we have to deal with uh, uh, today. And you know we've got to be clear about who our friends are and who are the enemies and stand uh, with our friends. Let me ask you two more questions. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but um, there's this uh, there's this idea, not really an idea. There's a theory when you're looking at, I, I guess, a lot of students that, that study international relations. They they kind of they kind of rely on the the anarchist view, where you know, basically, you know, actions in the in the world community are done by nation states, and these nation states kind of compete against one another for power and things of that nature. And 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 things like international law are not necessarily laws. They're only they're only things like a guideline, and they only mean something if someone else can impose something on you to coerce your cooperation. In, in many respects, and so what this leaves is you have a big, you know, have larger, more powerful nations able to do whatever, and you have you know the rest of the world kind of having to stick within a framework because larger, more powerful nations will basically impose things on them if they do not. Well, I mean, part part of that is true in terms of, of the the notion of international law, that the law usually is a reflection of of the interests of the most powerful, including the most powerful nations. But part of the process of, of revolutionary change is uh, addressing uh, uh, every aspect of society, including uh, the dominant laws. Uh, but in terms of the whole role of the nation state, one of the issues with, 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 with um, anarchism is that there's an assumption, which is, I guess, in some ways, theoretically true, uh, that the state is a instrument of repression. Um, and it, and it, it, it is, to a certain extent. Uh, the question becomes, uh, whose state are we talking about? And who might be uh, being rep uh, repressed? Uh, the notion that these complex uh, societies are going to be transformed into self-governing, uh, locally initiated um, administrative units uh, without a powerful state as part of a of a transitional period. It to me is sort of uh, 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 naive, uh, dangerously naive. Uh, there's going to be a period in which there's going to be a state, but that state will be a state that is um, under the control and representing the interests of the majority of the people. That revolutionary state, once we take state power, uh, is going to be a state that's going to be used as an instrument in the, in the revolutionary process. Now, we can dismantle that state as we develop, uh, but it, it's part of, in my opinion, it's part of a transitional period. Uh, the only way we're gonna be able to prevent uh, a return of the, of the power of the ruling class is we have to have uh, a, a, a counter force powerful enough to basically repress the interests of that element of society because they're not just going to go away, my friend. And so if we have a state that represents the people, then the people can make sure that once we take uh, power from the bourgeoisie, uh, that we don't allow uh, that bourgeoisie to return to power. Implicit in the first half, you guys, uh, of what uh, John was talking about, you know, he's really he's really referring to like when we talk about nation states, who they act on and when they follow their national interests, whose interests are they? They're not necessarily us like international relations will say that when a state amasses power, 
that it's individual subjects of that state that benefit from that increased power, increased safety, increased security, or increased ability to do stuff. But that's not really how it works out. What happens is you have, you know, the ruling class of that society that uh, that gets the benefit of those things, and everybody else deals with the consequences and in many kind and many times the costs. So I had a another, the last question I'm gonna ask you. And then I, I, I kind of just want to like kind of close out and kind of summarize our conversation we had here that you reiterate some points that you want to that you feel that really stick out and then we'll close it out. And I want to thank you for your time. But um, I had a comment where I was speaking about the uh, the benefits of maybe like some sort of federal job guarantee versus the benefits of a UBI. Do you have a position on that? Well, I think that the uh, I think a job guarantee is probably the more progressive uh, position. Uh, there, there's contradictory um, positions on UBI. Uh, some people see this as a reform that uh, ensures that it helps to legitimize the continued existence of capitalism, um, where the uh, uh, a job as a human right uh, is something that um, is part of a a, a new process uh, in which. Um, the implication is that everybody has a right to be able to uh, find a, a way to uh, to to live, uh, and that if that means um, uh, finding a job or having a job, it is the responsibility of the collective state to ensure that that in fact happens. So, having the ability to work if one wants to work, uh, and having jobs at a a level in which you have uh, are able to not just subsist, but also to to thrive, mm. uh, it is important. Uh, UBI, you know, is I mean, how you how do you set that? What are, what are the level of, subs, of subsistence? Um, what does that mean in terms of? I mean, because you know, part of the argument for that too is that technological development is going to allow uh, less and less people to work. But you know, that assumes that. That these technological innovations are, are really uh, innovations that are going to result in uh, making life better for the vast majority of the people, uh, and I don't see that happening. I don't see that because technology right now is not controlled by the people; it's controlled by these private entities. Again, so we run into that what's question. Happening, what's happening is we're making millions and millions of people are now redundant, superfluous, um, and. UBI is not going to be enough to uh, to to reverse that. The only way we're going to reverse that is by having a new kind of economy, a economy based on socialism. And that's why many of us are, in fact, socialists and believe that uh, the only way we're going to uh, address these issues that face common humanity is when we do away with the capitalist system uh, and create uh, systems of socialist production and socialist social relations. And I, and I think you made an interesting point there when you talked about technology. You, you asked a good question, the same question we ask all the time. You know, who benefits? Who controls this? Who benefits from this? Technological advancement is, is like anything else. You know, it's great, you know, depending on who's, who's using it and for what purpose. You know, so you're right. You know, if, if technology is to continue to make human beings redundant, you know, who is going to benefit from that? Is that benefit going to be basically amassed by a few people and everybody else is left off of a subsistence that they can take away at any moment because of course with wealth comes power. If you have people living off of a subsistence, you know, wage basically, you know, they can just be held held hostage. You know, exactly. you can just be held I mean, hostage with it. Exactly. And it keeps on going back to the the, the, the basic fundamental question around uh, property relations. You know, who owns, you know, who owns the major means of production? Is it the people? Or will it be the small minority of the population? I mean, that's that's a good question. And let's say we get to a situation where only 10 percent of the population needs to work. You know, at least for the federal jobs guarantee, what you can do is you say, OK, the remaining work will be split evenly or as best we can amongst the remaining people that need to work. Maybe a job sharing where you work a couple of hours or one day a week and everybody has a job. You all get paid you know, a decent standard of living, but at least the benefit of technological advancement is shared by all as best we can get it. And I think that that's something that the UBI just doesn't have that I think the federal jobs guarantee can have if we ever got to such a point. But, you know, that's that's far beyond 
you know, where I think we're actually going to get, we're, we're like trying to look in the, you know, 50 years, a hundred years into the future and try to figure out what things are going to be. And it's all like shipped in the sand. Right? It's like, these are just projections. Yeah, but it won't be a hundred years. You always see in your lifetime, the, the fundamental changes that will take place because the internal logic of capitalism is such that basically it's breaking down and that we're going to see a, a new system, either a socialist system in the next 20 to 30 years, or it's going to be a, a, a protracted uh, period of fascism. Now, that's interesting that you said that, you know, when you when you see times of desperation, you know, there's always there's always two possibilities, right? You know, it can either go right or left. You can you can end up in, in a revolutionary period where things can go a certain way and it can try to alleviate the things or you can end up in a, in a counter revolutionary period where, you know, it kind of gets real, real hot and, you know, a lot of things kind of shift and it can get really, really bad. And I, and I think that that's something you can run, run into no matter the, no matter the time period, like across time, that's just, that's just the cycle how it goes. Well, I mean, the, 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 the issue though is that conditions today are unique in their, their particular development that, there's no reforming of this of this of this system at this point that either there's going to be a a, a, a push up from the bottom up uh, and then you're going to have the pressure the political pressure on the part of the of the ruling class to enter to a, a coalition with elements of the petty bourgeoisie in order to maintain their control that means fascism or there's going to be uh, a socialist transformation there are no there's no third way in my opinion. Oh, you don't believe like some sort of a uh, reform period can take place and misdirect once again? No, no there's no reformism of this. <laughs> wow. And, and you know what, see, we talked this whole conversation. Neoliberalism, and was, neoliberalism was the last reform. And, and, and that's, that's, you see what the, the consequence of that is, it's been, it's breaking, it's, 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 it, it has emerged with uh, contradictions that cannot be reconciled. There's no, there's no reform from, from this latest uh, reform. There's I no see. return to, uh, there's no return to uh, Keynesianism. It's not, it's not possible at this point. And, 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 and you know, I think uh, at first I will say like uh, in my transition, kind of like how my politics develop, you know, I, I, I sort of started off like that and I wanted to kind of go back to the new deal. I was like, all we need is a new deal. And then, you know, the more you know, the more you learn and, 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 and the more you study economics in general, you know, I'm a graduate student. I don't study economics, but I'm just saying the more you study about it, I went and took some coursework on it to have a better understanding. And I read a lot of material and I, and I came to understand that the 60s was unique. There were certain things that existed during the post-war period that made a lot of things possible that don't exist today. And that's why going back to that as as if it's just possible to go back to something like that is 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 is, is like a it's like a fairy tale. You you're going back and trying to live like something that that was just a once in a lifetime thing that happened and it's gone. And, you know, and and it, and it came and it existed to make to give credibility to the policies that are going on during that time, but it didn't give enough credit to the situation that we found ourselves in at the time that made such a thing possible. So now I completely agree with you. When you say we can't go back to that, it's not possible. And you know, I want to basically agree and say, you're right. It is not possible. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I want to, you know, in this conversation, we've said a whole, whole bunch of stuff. I've kept you for a long time. I appreciate you coming on to the show. You know, um, I be, I'm going to basically go back and comb through this conversation. It was, it was basically gold and things that you just kept saying and kept saying. And it just reminds me that I must be on to something if someone as wise as you is, is, is kind of saying some similar things to what I've said, it kind of in the same vein. I think, I think that there's a lot of things that um, the left has forgotten and that if we are to be successful, we have to remember. And I think chief among them is trying to accommodate neoliberalism, trying to tie ourselves to it, trying to get along with it for the sake of some, you know, short term, small gain just because we want to call just because we want to have some sort of victory because nobody likes to continuously lose is detrimental you know I'll, I'll talk to people and they say hey you know what's the long-term strategy what's the short-term strategy well short term we want to do this is like well hey there's opportunity cost because you're supporting and making alliances with neoliberalism or neoliberals 
you are not doing revolutionary change outside of that. You are not doing these other things that need to be done. They run counter to one another. So you are basically focusing on the short term, but you're giving up what has to be done on the long term. And I think that that's something the left has to grapple with. What would you say about that as your last comment? Well, I have to agree that basically you're absolutely right that, uh, you know, we, we, we have strategic uh, challenges, but we can't really uh, come up with the kind of strategies we need to develop until we're clear about the vision. And that vision has to be grounded in a clear uh, understanding of the objective conditions we find ourselves in. So, again, it goes back to what we started talking about, the need for serious uh, study a serious grappling with uh, theory uh, so that we can understand the complexity of, of, of the current moment. That's the only way you can determine how to move forward. I like that. And what did you say? Without revolutionary theory, there is no revolution. That's what Emma Carter Brown said. Yes, sir. Wow. I'm going to have to get that quote from you. I need to go back and do some reading myself. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ajamu, for joining us. Um, that's it for the show. Close it out, David.